buying or selling a home is one of the most important decisions you'll make in your entire life. Call the Holly Ritchie team today for a free market analysis. Welcome to Season 5 of Spanning the Need with Anthony Spano. There's a lot of surprises in Season 5. We're very excited with a jam-packed season. And to start that season off, we're going to talk to Justin Jennings, Superintendent of the Youngstown City Schools. Justin, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Well, it's, it's, it's great. We, we, it, school's pretty much starting now. We're pretty much in school. Um, and, and we look at a variety of things coming, coming down the pipeline. And uh, a lot of people have seen you on TV or through interviews. And, and we're going to sit down and talk in depth about a, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one thing that people may not know, they've seen you on TV or, or some interviews. Talk about your background and, and how you got started in education. Well, I'm, uh, I always like to say this is my second career. I played professional basketball before and um, got injured in playing professional basketball. That's why you're 6'5". <laughs> you can tell. Right. And uh, went, back to, went back to school and I got my master's um, in special ed. Became a special ed teacher, basketball coach, and kind of evolved from there. Eventually, uh, assistant principal, principal, and special ed director. I, I like to say the easiest way to explain my roles is I've done everything except be an athletic director, which go figure. I was an athlete, but I've never been an athletic director. Hey, so. you never know the years ahead. You never know retirement or anything like that. You have the background in athletics. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it, kind of what made you come to Youngstown? Um, you, you know, you've You've heard about us. You've you've seen what's been going on before. Did you know anything about Youngstown before you came? No, I mean not a whole lot. My my both basically my career as an administrator has been a, a, in a turnaround principal setting. Mm -hmm. So I've always been involved with turnaround, you know, in a building, but never not so much a district. Mm -hmm. So th for me, I, I was a superintendent before in Michigan. For me, so this was a challenge when I heard about it. It was a challenge for me to be able to kind of help turn around the district. I mean, being the in that role of a CEO is, is a little different because there's no board presence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you have to make decisions that everybody doesn't like so you don't have to necessarily run it through people. But still, you know, considering that you still work for the taxpayers, I mm -hmm. mean, you, you hold yourself to that standard. So it was, it was a little different. And, you know, when I took the job, I had some friends from Ohio and they were kind of like, dude, what are you doing? And then I had people who I wanted to help me and come work with me. And because of, you know, the, what they perceive as a Youngstown reputation, they, I mean, they just flat out said no. Well, and, and we look at that as uh, you, when you say you're from Youngstown, people will either say good or bad things. That's anywhere. Anywhere. And, and we talk about what was the image that was perceived before you came? You talked, you talked a little bit about like, well, I'm, I'm not going to come work for you or anything like that. What was that image that, that you remember? Because you didn't know much about Youngstown. Right. Did you know where, I like to ask, did you know where Youngstown was? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I heard of Youngstown. I had friends who grew mm -hmm. up in Youngstown, went to college with people from Youngstown. So I, I heard of it. But basically the reputation was sometimes, you know, dangerous, different things like that. And, and of course, because of the test scores, we knew um, it was it would be a struggle educationally because of that and it wasn't a situation where it just happened over five years it'd been a 20 25 year span so it's something we really had to look at because when you get into change like this it didn't happen overnight and it it, it won't change overnight well it's really about getting the time to make sure you can enact that change so that's that's really that was really a bigger concern than anything else from some of my some of my, my mentors and constituents and, and buddies well and, and, and we talk about um, what people really give in their jobs that's a hard-working really um, family ethnic very big ethnic wise mm -hmm. Um, you've been around for about two or three years. This will be probably your first year as superintendent right. of, of the city schools um, for a five-year contract, if, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be around for a while. Um, but I think now you're going to be you go from CEO, like mm -hmm. we talked about, not reporting to to a board, but working side by side with them, to working side by side and, and working for as as the, they report you report to them. Uh, about six months ago, you gave a heartfelt speech at a board meeting. You, you talked about the image, about a variety of other topics. Um, can you talk about what your mindset was? Um, because I feel like with other people, 
you said what people may have been thinking for years and mm-hmm. really never said it publicly. Like, where were you? I mean, because I thought that speech, you just, you just, I think you just kind of emotionally just felt uh, relief. I'm not maybe relief isn't the right word, but really felt that you had to say something. Yeah, I, I, actually, it's, it's always interesting because a lot of times when people see things on the news, it's a soundbite. But people mm-hmm. don't realize I sat there for almost two hours mm-hmm. where people talk bad about the CEO. And often, and I'm, I mean, we're, we're here and I'm going to just be transparent like, I, like mm-hmm. I'm always. Things that happened previously with the CEO before I got here, mm-hmm. I, I often catch hell for it. Mm-hmm. And they never say a name. They just say the CEO. So people would just assume that it was me. And there were some things that were said back and forth. And, and my thing is, I'm here for kids. And anybody who knows me or you've been around and who works for me, they understand that. Mm-hmm. And after a while, it, it's hard not to take things personal because mm-hmm. it's a personal attack. And when you attack me, you're attacking the process that, that we are trying to enact in order to change what's been going on and change the perception. We have great teachers. We have great students. We have great parents, great administrators. But when you walk into our buildings, you'll see that. But a lot of people, they don't get the chance to walk into our building. So their perception is what right, they see right. in the soundbite or what exactly. they see in young, on Facebook or anything like that. And, and at that point, I just kind of we had just lost a student to somebody to violence. And like we're fighting a different fight and we shouldn't be fighting each other. We should really be looking at how we can fix the system. And that's something that that we need to do. And I'm not going to mention the name, but we had someone, uh, an elected official, a a nationally elected official who was in our building two years ago. I've been Mm -hmm. been in the district now going on four years, um, four years of the first. Um, And we had an elected official in our building and we were sitting there and we were conversing, we were talking and he kind of looked around. We were at one of the high schools and he was like, well, where are all the kids? I looked at him like they're in the classroom learning. He's like, well, that's not what I often hear. I said, well, I wish more people would come and actually see what's going on, you know, like you have. So now they can see it's not people, it's not kids who are out of control or doing anything like that. They are in the in the classroom and and we're really taking our time to teach them in their learning. Well, and I think it goes back to that notion of looking from the outside in mm-hmm. um we look at that okay i heard that there was this that happened at the school this happened last week or this happened moved from the the area to the school just a variety of different things mm-hmm. we look at a variety of challenges what are you talk a little bit about like okay oh, the kids are in the classroom they're they're learning what are some of those challenges that basically that you see ahead of you okay but at the same time, they're looking from the outside or just in the news that may people need to be aware of. Like you, like you said, the guy, the politician or the elected official came in and saw for the first first hand, not a second hand, not a third hand of hearing that story. What are some of those challenges that people really don't realize? I mean, we we have a lot a lot of our families. We have a huge uh, homeless population. We have a huge part of our. I mean, a huge. Poverty is huge for us. And I think not just from our school standpoint, but from a national standpoint, over the next three or four months, there's going to be a food shortage and people mm-hmm. are not paying attention. And one of the first places it's going to affect is our schools, because all of our school, all of our students eat for free. We have a grant where they do. But if they didn't, we still have over 90 percent of our kids who, who are um, eligible for free or reduced lunch. 90 percent. Over 90 percent. Wow. And that's huge. And that's, so I think the next one's like maybe 70 some percent. Yeah. I, I think those we look at different numbers for And what what does the definition of that? It's um, free lunches. I forget the, the saying it's Title One funding, correct? Correct. It, it, it goes back directly to our Title One funding, which is, you know, our at risk funding. So it's one of those at risk factors. So that's going to be a huge, huge thing for us. Our other thing is really parental involvement. But also community voice. I mean, we have school board meetings and the perception of what the school board meetings were like before and what they are now are two different things. We've, we've shaped the school board meetings where they're informative. So if you come, you're going to get information about what's going on in the school. What are we teaching? What are we spending money on? Those things that need to be transparent to get rid of the perception that, that we have. I mean, we had a conversation before and I have so many people who... Before we came, they would never have considered even working in, in Youngstown. But now we have people who 
are applying for jobs in Youngstown who would never have worked in Youngstown before. And during their interviews, they say, I would have never worked here before, but this is what caused me to be here. They can see our passion. They can see our administrators. So we really, part of changing that perception is, is what we're doing. And we, as a CEO, we I created, helped create a strategic plan with the community. And that's kind of what we use to drive everything we do because a lot of that was spending time with community members, with our staff members and, and looking at, what, are you, what is your perception of the building? What is your perception of our district? How can we change those things? And we put those strategies into action steps, and that's what we're working on right now. Well, and, and that's a good thing. And let's talk a little bit about the strategic plan. Talk about where you started, okay, to mm-hmm. where you are now with that strategic plan. Is there an opportunity for maybe more input from the public? How would they be able to do that? So, because like you want to be, you want to be transparent. Mm-hmm. So, how do they give their input or even find out about this? Because this is the first time I've heard about a strategic plan. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm, I'm, I only see what's. I mean, I have a one year old, so it's a little bit difficult. Mm-hmm. But how does that? How would that work? So, just to give a quick background, history background. When I first came in, of course, anyone who is enact, enacting change or hired to enact change, you don't come in and make automatic changes so <clears throat> i spent the time what i started off with with my four pillars i call them strategic emphasis not mm-hmm. plan because it was just me so my emphasis were four things and it was attendance it was uh community relations it was health and then um you know i'm not gonna remember the last one because i'm under pressure right now and the, oh the next one was actually educating our kids so <laughs> but you the, know how that works right, I mean, right. I just have, hey we're yeah so they, they all kind of kind of go hand in hand so from there we, we spent about a six months really using our strategic emphasis. And then we began to do what we call a SWOT analysis mm-hmm. with our community. So we I went, I visited personally by myself, went to every school to meet with any teachers, any custodians, any secretaries, anybody in the building who wanted to come. I didn't allow any other administrators, any of my central office people to be in there because I wanted it to be a genuine conversation because there was a, a perception that um, if, if you said something bad in our district that it would, it would come back on you later. And I wanted to get rid of that. So we spent the time to talk and, and kind of get that. And through that, with our staff and with the community, we built our strategic plan around those things. And then we went back and we asked the question, well, here's what, here's what our, it's, this is going to be a step in our plan. What do you think about this? And then from there, we built our, like I said, our goals. And it's actually called the U print, mm-hmm. the blueprint instead of the U print, the Youngstown print. print. Yep. And um, it's it's actually a ten year strategic plan. Mm-hmm. It's not just a year. So it's ten years, and it's broken down into five year and then yearly increments. So every year we have a kind of an emphasis that we're looking at to see if we're hitting those marks. And the reason why we did it for so long is we want. As the CEO, I didn't know if how long I would be here because I knew my job was legislated. And if something went wrong or I wasn't here anymore, at least the next person who came in under leadership, they would understand what we were trying to do. And they can either choose to use it and move forward or, you know, do their what they normally do, mm-hmm. which is do their own thing. But we wanted to do that. But it also gave us an opportunity to show the community how we're being how we're trying to be transparent. And, and I, don't, I don't necessarily take credit with that for that. But with that. During that time when we were out and about, it was also the time that we had a levy. Mm, uh, and our yeah. levy, the levy here in Youngstown passed at almost a 65% rate, which is un- almost well, it's and unheard think, of. And I think, and I, and I, I live in a city, mm-hmm. as we've discussed earlier, I think you have a lot of people that still support the city schools. Mm-hmm. As much as they've heard or seen on the news, it just happens that Youngstown or the city schools, no matter where you are, mm-hmm. kind of gets more of a bad rep depending on where you live in the country. It just, unless something massive happens. Right. And I think that shows the camaraderie and the transparency of, hey, the city of Youngstown, we're still here for our kids. We're still here for the school system. So how does that really like show when you go out to talk to these people like, hey, we're still behind you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I get that so often and, 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 and my, not running joke, but I often say this to my dad. Sometimes I wish that they would get up and say that in front of everybody. I get it a lot if I'm walking in the store, mm-hmm. if I'm sitting at the Mocha house or I'm doing anything. People come up and like, "Hey, keep doing what you're doing. We're watching you. We're supporting you. Or you know, we're yeah, they're for watching you, you right? <laughs> right, right, right. But but I get that a lot, and and I I think that for me, seeing the levy pass 
so um, easily was 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 a boost for me and, and our staff because people see they were really trying to do the right thing and, and they want they want a lot of people not most people want this to be successful. There's so many people who they may not have kids or grandkids who are in our system, but they were in our system, so it's a source of pride for them. It's kind of like I'm from Michigan, so I don't if, say that I don't say that state up. Well, there. I'm not a Michigan. Well, you know, but but I always tell people say it. Huh? Well, you can say you're an Ohio State fan. Oh no no, no I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Boilermaker, but we'll, we'll leave that alone. Oh, Spoilermakers in Ohio State football is not a. Then you know, if you're gonna go there, I'm gonna go Notre Dame. Oh no. <laughs> But a, a lot of like, I, like I said, I'm from Michigan, and if if you meet somebody from Detroit, they're gonna if they tell you they're from Detroit, they're not from Detroit. <laughs> they're from somewhere outside. But if they're from Detroit, they're gonna tell you like the street, the area they're from. Just like here, when I meet somebody from Youngstown, I can tell you if they're actually from Youngstown and they went to one of our schools, because they're gonna say, "Hey, I'm from Youngstown, and I'm from the Rand High School. I'm from Wilson." Yeah. That's how you know. So. Oftentimes, or I'm, Smoky Hollow, or Briar right, Hill, like they'll right. name a specific area, like. I live on the west side. Right. I know exactly where. Yeah, I get right. it. And, and that's that's what normally happens. It's so funny because people will come in and introduce themselves. Well, I'm an East High graduate from 1976. I just want to tell you. So that those are the things that, that you do. But I, I get that a lot. And and it's you know. Do you do you see? You mentioned that like, do you see that more now than you did before when you first got here? I, I do. I, I mean, I, I feel as though. It's starting to be a bigger sense of pride where people are not so reluctant to do it. When I first came, I would have people who came up who talked to me. It's like, yeah, you know. But now it's like, hey, they'll be like, hey, I'm, you know, East grad from 1974. I'm a Cheney grad. I'm a cowboy. Once a cowboy. I mean, they have the look. Well, it's, everything. It's interesting because I'm my doctor from Youngstown, like that whole West Side, South Side, North Side, like that whole and East Side as well was mm-hmm. just a lot of people moved out. Right. I mean, you're looking at a population of what maybe 180 to 200 thousand people before the steel mills went under. Mm-hmm. So that was a huge digress of people, and I think they didn't know what to do. I think they tried to, the city of Youngstown tried to do what it did, and that's why I think you, you look at trying to change the culture. How do you do that? I mean, you've been here three, four years, and you like you said in an earlier thing that it's been trying 20 years to get scores Mm -hmm. up and and how do you change the culture i mean because it's like oh it's just another it's maybe just another superintendent trying to do what they want to do before they move on and that's i'm not saying that's happened but it's just a normal normal thing in almost any position i mean first of all i think you have to ask those questions but second of all you have to listen Mm -hmm. and you have to act on some of those answers i'm I'm a leader that i'm always going to listen doesn't mean i'm going to do what you tell me to do because it may not be the right thing but you're going to know from our conversation that I've listened. And I think really, for me, it's really been opening up myself and showing people my heart and what my heart is for. And I think that's really been, for us, been a, for me and for our school district and really our community, it's been a culture shift because a lot of people come up to me and say, you know what, I've never spoken to a superintendent before. Or I would go into a building and a, and a teacher would say, you're so accessible and different things like that. So that's really part of changing the culture. But you also have to understand with that, there's some people who don't want the culture change. There are some people who want it the way it's always been. And I'm not saying that from a racial standpoint or this standpoint, but just from we want Youngstown City Schools the way they've always been. I don't want to lose Cheney. I don't want to lose Wilson. I don't want to lose Rand. We want it to be. So you, you have to be, there has to be a balance. But I, I think mostly by... Surrounding myself with people who think like me and they treat people like me. And I think that's one of the things that's different in our buildings now than it's been in the past. When people come in, they feel welcome and we want we want to be able to service them. And that's something a little, it's a culture shift. Mm. And I've worked with several of the, Dr. Webb, Dr. McGee, all great superintendents. And, and it, it seems that um, there's always a challenge over every term of a, of a superintendent. And I, and I think that's maybe what, um, then all of a sudden, the, the state uh, house bill, I forget what it was. 70. 70, mm-hmm. that just came in and took over the city schools, which right. I think a lot of people were against locally. But I think they were try- at the state house, they were trying to do a variety of things. And that created the academic stress committee. Right. Um, we, it, we talk about the academic stress committee as a working board. Explain what it, the academic uh, distress commission was because people I think get the wrong idea of what it is mm-hmm. but give me what is the what is this commission so if I can answer the first part of your uh, question if, kind of statement 
I don't think I could be. Uh, I don't think Dr. McGee or or, or or Dr. Webb could be worse because I, as being the CEO, I was more hated than they could ever be. So now I'm stepping into kind of a different role. So well, for I'm the not act- saying I, I worked with them. To, yeah. it, it's I've each per. It's just been a changeover. Right. right. No, I, I mean I've, I've already got the hate, so oh. they can't hate me any worse as a superintendent as they did. I they don't hate you, CEO, CEO, but. The Academic Distress Committee Commission was actually, you know, formed. It, it, it was kind of a watchdog for me, mm-hmm. not nec- because with House Bill seventy, the CEO ha- had all operational and managerial control. So there, there wasn't a situation where you know Dr. Richard would say, "Hey, Justin, you can't do that. You have to do this." It was more of, "Is this legal? Making sure you're doing the legal thing. What are you doing?" And they were my, they were the people who evaluated my performance, almost like a board. It was it was almost like a board, but mm-hmm. it was a non a non decision making body. So mm-hmm. I, I had Dr. McGee who was on there, um, Dr. Maria Hoffmaster who's now the um, a curriculum director out in Poland, mm-hmm. um, Dr. Richard who was at the time the assistant state superintendent. So real big educators, absolutely that knew absolutely. that knew the education system. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and everybody had their own little niche. Dr. McGee was was a person who was over the budget, so got a lot. Uh, we worked closely with um, Dr. Hoffmaster with our academics to to do some things. As a matter of fact, with with her tutelage and some of our staff, we created a, a um, literacy plan that's actually an exemplar for the state. So for everybody who kind of often says there weren't anything that happened during you know House Bill 70, there were some good things that happened. Now, from a standpoint of being a, being a, a person, a, a, a African American male in an urban city, it, what I, I it, it's not something that I would recommend. But I was hired to do a job, and that's what I I, I tried my best mm-hmm. to do, you know, in, in the situation. And I got lucky in which I you know got board members who saw that what we were doing, and, and they wanted to sustain what we were doing. And I think one of the most thing one the most important things you hear from people is just that consistency. Having somebody here, and you mentioned it earlier, having a different person every year, or every two years, is not sustainable for change, mm-hmm. right? So if you if Walmart or GM or something they had a new CEO every year you would you would see this things going in a different direction but they they those corporations are consistent with their leadership and we one of the things that was mentioned on the very last commission meeting was benchmarks mm-hmm. i think there's 24 categories right okay and one of your comments and correct me if i'm wrong is um the board worked with the commission to create benchmarks i think you probably were involved in that mm-hmm. and you mentioned they were too low you wanted the benchmarks higher. Explain that. So the the, the benchmark that you speak of uh, is the AIP. So the mm-hmm. AIP is is a plan. It's the academic improvement plan in which the the law that changed that that would get us out of House Bill seventy requires for us to do. So we had we have to have we had to create benchmarks. Mm-hmm. So those two bench those twenty four benchmarks are the things that we created. Mm-hmm. And within those benchmarks, there's a percentage that you have to keep up for a certain amount of time for us to do it. So of those 24 benchmarks, we have to reach 51% in order to be out in the next three years, in order to be out of the, out from under academic distress. Mm-hmm. So our, our feeling was, well, my feelings, so the, the plan was put together by our um, school board, mm-hmm. par- partial, partially my staff and myself, and also some with some input from the academic um, distress team as mm-hmm. well. And those benchmarks, some of the percentages we thought was low because those were things that we're doing already and we were reaching a certain point. Mm -hmm. But understand, and this is a great point, and I'm glad I got the opportunity to do this, the AIP and our strategic plan and our academic plan are three different things. So the AIP is strictly for us to get out of out from under the academic distress commission for the state of Ohio. Correct for okay. the state of Ohio. That has nothing to do with our our regular strategic plan and our, our academic plan or, or our um our yeah our academic plan our state academic plan. So many plans. Right. There's there's <laughs> so many of them. Yeah. And so the reason why I said that is because our, our standards and what we want to hit our benchmarks are higher than what they have in the AIP. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason why I said that. And, and then I expect I expect more of our scholars. I expect more out of our scholars. I expect more out of our teachers. We, we spend the time to do the professional development to help them learn. And, and that's what our expectation is. So. Of course, from a standpoint, we you don't want them too high where you can't reach them because then you'll be back. There'll be another CEO. But but there is a point where you want it where it's something where our kids our kids have to learn, and we want our, we want the community to trust in what we're doing. Okay, and, and we we and we talk about you talk about the plans. You also look at the population decrease, and over the years, 
the city schools have lost students. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably, uh, I may be off on this, but thousands oh. of students each year. How do you combat that? Um, I know because no matter where you live, depending on where you live, there's an, nowadays there's an open enrollment school somewhere. So how do you combat that and, and have the opportunity to bring those kids back? Mm -hmm. I, I'm old school when it comes to this. And, and I play for an old school coach in, in college and, and play for Larry Brown a little bit and, and as I play, play professional. And, and my one suggestion is present a better product. That's mm -hmm. what we have to do. So we, we've tried our best to do that the best we can, not only with a product, but with the things that we do and, and the spaces that we have. One of those things that we've had to kind of, I, I like to use the word chase people back as we use our, I mean, our early college. So our early college has expanded. We have a middle school okay. and we're going to go all the way down to the third grade. And, and that's been one of our biggest impetus for bringing students back. And so we have a waiting list for early college. Um, the other thing is we, we've, I mean, you, you can see we've upgraded our sports facility. So we have a brand new um, turf stadium that we'll start mm -hmm. this year. And I think that's something will help us as well. Not that turf is going to bring people back, but it gives them a better, we, we have better, um, opportunity to, to bring other people in who would never come in because it, it, it was difficult. And um, I, I think what, what else is, is really being visible in the community and, and, and showing ourselves and, and changing the face of, of what we what people perceive of the school, the school board, our teachers, our administrators as well. Well, and we talk about the image earlier and, and you talked about some of the setbacks with your students, poverty, can you account for trauma as well? We, we talk about a lot of downsides to poverty, but also understanding bringing those students back is hard because of trauma. Right. And, and you, you look at it that it's families throughout the district. And how do you handle that? You, you mentioned in your heartfelt speech about shootings and, and, and just kind of how that plays out violence-wise. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Because I think anyone... Mental health is huge right now in our in our schools. Right. Well, a lot of we, we've getting a, we've gotten a lot of money towards mental health and lately security because of, you know, the, the school shootings that happened at the end of the Which school is last sad. year. Right. But but you realizing that almost 40 percent of all of our students in our school have someone who has been or will or who has been incarcerated or is currently incarcerated in the last six months. So that's an automatic trauma. You add COVID onto there. You add the deaths of COVID onto there. You add the other things. And, and there's so many other things that you can add. The, uh, we talked about the homeless population increase. We, we talk about for the last, basically for the last two and a half years since COVID started, we, we've tried to make sure that all of our students are fed, our scholars are fed. So some of them go home with a meal, a meal every day. Sometimes we have family meals. So to make sure that our families are fed. But, the, but that trauma is a huge piece. And, and even some of the things, some of the laws and different things that we that, that are created causes trauma for our district as well. So you talked about the population. Well, we have about 4,800 students in Youngstown City Schools, but we are responsible for transporting almost 7,000. Wow. So with the bus shortage going on and a bus driver shortage going on across the country, right. there, there's a whole different layer to what we're doing with trauma because now we have kids who may not be able to go to school because the bus driver is out and we don't have an, another bus driver to run that route. So there's other different, there's other things that, that take place that causes that trauma as it's well. almost like a domino effect since co pandemic has shown, I think, the vulnerabilities mm -hmm. of a lot of things, not just poverty and, and trauma, but a lot of things Absolutely. that we thought were very little now are huge right right and and um I, I have no i have nothing against charter schools so that's not my reason for the comment but that's caused a rift in in what we're doing in public education because a lot of our funding is being taken away but it's not it's not fair the way that there's not an accountability for us like it is for, i mean accountability for them like it is for us and like i said we're responsible for transporting those students it, and so if you think about any other industry if if walmart doesn't have something they're not going to be responsible for making sure that Meyer has that product mm -hmm. and send and, and taking that person to Meyer. But that's that's what we we've done in education. That that's what happened in Youngstown. So because we were we were labeled a, a persistently failing school, we're responsible for any student who lives within our city limits, mm -hmm. which we have over nine thousand students who live in our city limits. You can see we we only have about forty eight hundred in there. We're responsible for their transportation to where they go within a certain radius so of, you of our pro school. You pro you approximately have about. 42, 4,300 kids that are actually not in the city schools, Correct. but are out 
in an open enrollment school. Is that is that, am I understanding those numbers? If if my math is correct, correct. Open enrollment or private okay. private school. So if they go to a private or a parochial school, so if they decide to go to St. Andrews or 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 Ursuline or anywhere else, we're responsible for that transportation mm-hmm. and. If they don't take transportation, we still may be responsible for giving them what they call transportation in lieu. By state law. By state law. Okay. And also, just like, let's say we have one student who goes to St. Andrews, mm-hmm. and, and and our bus doesn't take that student. Mm-hmm. If that if that school or that parent calls in, we could be fined $15,000 for that incident. Mm-hmm. So if you go around and you look at, and I know you'd love to do your research, you go around and look at Columbus. Their budget, I'm just throwing a number, I may have been $60 million for transportation last year. Mm-hmm. Well, due to those not bus driver shortages or routes not being ran, they got almost $13 million in fines, in which that $60 million from the state is $13 million less because it could have been a couple students or we can't control bus drivers right. who show up for work or if we don't have enough bus drivers one thing i can say about youngstown we have enough buses now but we don't have enough drivers so we just is it that hard to find bus drivers it it, it, it absolutely is what do you think the problem is personally your I opinion mean, a, a lot of it is came from the COVID scare because we had bus drivers as a matter of fact when we started COVID, we had more bus drivers than we had buses mm-hmm. but then as COVID went along we we had more uh buses then we have bus drivers and, it, and it's a shortage everywhere across the country yeah you've seen um a lot of uh educational entities around the area always looking for bus drivers i have a family member that's a bus driver mm-hmm. so I, I i hear just hey they're short she's doing double route right uh and and i get it um i think that we look at it's like throwing money at a wall and seeing if it sticks at, at times mm-hmm. Um, but then there's some good that comes about, and and let me let me say this: what out of your things that you look at mm-hmm. at the city of Youngstown, what is one thing that you want to leave after you've retired and 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 kind of look forward to in your kind of I'd say your mind? What would you like to accomplish? You know what, for me, I, I've said this since I've come, and I've said even when it's time for me to go, the biggest uh, test for me or, or, or testament of my work is that you will start to see our scholars want to come back to Youngstown. That's, mm-hmm. that's been a big thing. When you, when you talk to a lot of our graduates, they'll, I'll talk to them and they'll say, you know what, Mr. Jennings, I'm going to Kent State, I'm going to Ohio State, I'm going to Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. I was going to say the other word, but I'm not going to get in trouble. But I'm never coming back. That's what you hear. And, mm-hmm. and, and for me, that, that's huge because now... Who's going to be our leaders? Who's going to be our next leaders? Who's going to have the passion to come back home and lead the way that we need need us to be led? Because you, you got to, my mama would say, um, a lot of us old folk, we, we not, we're not going to be the ones to do it. It has to be that, that younger generation to do it. And so really my, my litmus test would be watching our scholars leave and go to those colleges and universities and maybe be successful a little while, but come back. Or some, after they graduate, they come back to do that work. And, and, and particularly in the educational setting. I was in a um, conference on Tuesday at the ESC, and our the largest, probably most prestigious school in the country cut their education program. There's no undergrad education program at Harvard. What is that saying about education? What is that saying about our profession? If the, the best, what's perceived as the best educational think tank in the world does, they don't have an educational undergrad educational program. So we really, our, our focus, we have a lot of focuses. And, and that would probably be what I would say would be my biggest um, litmus test for success. Because I know that just schools across the country, COVID has really made them look at their curriculums across the board to cut programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, some programs are very small and some programs are very big. And so you're going to get that push and pull type mentality. And, and we look at, just the city of Youngstown in general, like you mentioned, I do like my my history research thing, and, and that number that you were mentioning, the thirteen million in fines, give give or take, um, don't quote me on that, um, is huge. Just to do what that is, and is there something that could be changed at the state level? I mean, we, we man, I'm I'm gonna really get in trouble, but I, I won't get in trouble because it's not something that I said before. I haven't said before. We we really need to. Um, make sure we know who we're putting in office because education is one of the few things that 
we're regulated by people who aren't educators. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things that we do is regulated by laws of, and people who make those laws. They don't have educators. They may have been an educator in the past, maybe one or two out of the 50, or their wife or their son or daughter is an educator. But as far as actually looking at it, it it's, it's not good. And, and I'm an educator, and I can tell you right now, based on where a student lives, I can tell you what their test scores are going to be. You pretty much know. Mm -hmm. So now it's about really fixing it. And it's not about throwing money at it, but it's about giving giving the educators or the experts the freedom to do the work that they need to do. A lot of our work that we do now is compliance. It's not really focused on how can we help specific kids because we, you have to know, and I've, I've gotten in trouble for saying this before, but everybody's saying it now. College isn't meant for everybody. No, but when it, you, it's not. But when you look at our curriculum and you look at what we're supposed to do, everything is a college-based college, college based curriculum. Now we've used the term college or career-based, but we, we use that term, but we haven't really changed what we do academically. Would you say that... Now, I've heard this just from... This is hearsay, so I'm, I just want... I'd rather... This is a question for me personally. Mm -hmm. Is it true that you guys are, are preparing more for the, the state tests than actually teaching? No, I, I you would... You see where I'm going? Like, I would, I would... I mean, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a yes... Well, but it's, it's a yes and no because we get questions and we understand what that's like. Mm -hmm. But but I, I can't say that we teach to the test because for, from my standpoint, no. Right, But okay. I, I can tell you there, there's places where it's being done. Uh -huh. And... and um, the test changes so often that it's kind of hard to teach to the test. Right. So, but but I can tell you, uh, in in the past, maybe in the past five or ten years, in in a place like Youngstown or Urban School District, we absolutely talked talked to the test because we knew if we got to Safe Harbor, we wouldn't be in, there wouldn't be a CEO here. Right. But I think now we've kind of wisened up to understand that's not the way to do it because you can teach to the test and look, you can teach to the test. So you can be five years down the road and you haven't improved any. So now our focus is really on improving those skills. But no, I, I can tell you that that has definitely taken place. Yeah, and, and sometimes my my insight is a couple of years off, especially with three years of pandemic. My mind is sometimes because right. you just you don't see anyone. You don't really talk to anyone. Right. So, Justin, I appreciate you coming down and, and talking with us in in-depth. I appreciate your insight and honesty. Thank you. Um, and, and I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Um, now, I like to have fun with my uh with my guests so mm -hmm. i got a couple questions for you and you're out of water so that's good yeah so some some just some fun questions for you to get people to really know and and where you where you are what's your best accomplishment um professional or or personal it doesn't matter it's i mean i would definitely hands down my children i mean mm -hmm. daughter's a senior at michigan state my son's um 30 years old, grandson, working, successful. I would definitely say my children. Okay. Best memory? My best memory of anything? Could be any just, personal or, or, or professional. I, I, would, I would just, it's not just one, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event. It's like, it's like, I just remember being young and being having Christmas dinner with my family. When we grew up, we didn't have a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Never got a lot of gifts. But we always, I mean, we always had fun. I, I, I tell people, I didn't realize I was poor until I got to college. <laughs> I didn't. We always had food. I mean, my parents were always there. It was simple. Right, right. I mean, so I, I didn't realize, you know, you know how I lived mm -hmm. during that time until I actually got to college. Uh -huh. Who's your role model? My dad. Dad and mom, definitely my parents. My mom has passed away, but definitely my dad and mom, hands down. That's a that's a no-brainer. My dad is a phenomenal guy. My mom um, passed away in 2013. She had a stroke um, before eight, eight years before she passed away, and my dad stopped what he was doing. He took care of her for eight years, and I'm yeah. it definitely, definitely my dad. And it opens eyes absolutely when you, when you see that. If there was last question, if there was one person you would want to meet, past or present. Who would it be and why? <laughs> mm, that's a tough one. What? All the other questions weren't tough. Nah, nah, oh. that's a tough one because there's so many, there's so many different. You can people give a, so you can give ways. a couple names, it, it, but I think it just it makes people understand right. and, and and really show what what's going on. From a from a family standpoint, I would have loved to meet my my great great grandparents to kind of see what their life was like and how they shaped the generations behind them. That that would definitely be. If I had to choose somebody famous. It would probably be, I, I, I would 
God, my, man, that's a hard one. Probably be like my, it would be Martin Luther King, just okay. kind of to understand his temperament and how he handled himself when, especially back then. Yeah, how he handled himself when when things like that, when when you know things happen and how he had to deal with people. That would definitely that would have been a, that'd be a great conversation. Yeah. Just sitting at a table and having coffee with the, with how smart he was. Right. People don't realize he was a smart man. Absolutely. And I think people under, only maybe depending on if you're a history buff like I am. His speeches, mm-hmm. but just his knowledge of what was going on right. and just his in-depth of history in general yeah. knew what was going on and everything like that. So right. that, that's, a, that's a good one. Absolutely. Justin, I appreciate you taking time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us for the start of Season 5 with the superintendent of the Youngstown City Schools, Justin Jennings. There will be a jam-packed season this year. We hope you'll join us the rest for more events, podcasts, shows. You can go to anthonyvspano.com. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.